Hi, I'm David Tower and welcome again to the Theories of Everything program on Channel 31 Community Television. This is the second program in our series Theories of Cyber Futures. In our first program we examined new computing paradigms that will power our civilization into the future beyond the traditional von Neumann Turing model. They were serial processes. The new systems, the new computers, work in parallel and therefore have dramatically greater power. We looked at four different models. We looked at the neural computing model, which works on the same principle as the human brain, which has billions and billions of neurons, which work in coordination and are amazing in their ability to recognise patterns, because that's basically what the brain is, a pattern machine. So we've modelled new types of neural computing that run on traditional computers, generally at this stage, along that line. It's like having a picture painting a thousand words. A serial computer has to analyse things step by step, word by word. A neural computer does it in one big picture, flushing out patterns, sifting through patterns. So it's exceptionally good for analysing speech and writing and business transactions and in fact blood vessels in your eye when you're trying to draw some access at an ATM in the future. The second model that we looked at was the genetic algorithm, the evolutionary computing model, the model that nature uses traditionally. Nature's a tinkerer. It's constantly sifting through uh, designs. The designs may be new species. In evolutionary computing, the designs may be electrical circuits. And it's constantly changing the variables in that design as a gene. It's modelled as a gene in the chromosome. And it's constantly mixing and matching to find the best combination. And when it finds that combination, it hangs onto it and then remodels again to get a slightly more optimised, improved combination. But it works in parallel too. So you may have an electronics design, a circuit design, that has, in fact, 500 variables. So the, elect the evolutionary computing model generates populations containing 500 variables and mixes and matches, mutates them, tests them out, and comes up with some amazing results, all in parallel. So it can do jobs that would take a traditional computer months and months. It can do them, in fact, in, in hours or even less. The third model that we looked at was the quantum computing model. Now, quantum computers are truly amazing. And as we discussed last time, they're either they're just about at the early commercial stage. They're just coming off the prototype drawing board, if you like. Quantum computers derive their power by being able to run in parallel a combination of subatomic particle states. The subatomic states are usually in the form of a spin, a magnetic spin, which can be up one way or down another. And they combine together their waves intermingle, and so that you can put in ten different inputs, but it can go through the combinations of all those ten inputs, all the permutations and combinations simultaneously, and be tweaked, and out will come the answer in a fraction of a second. And quantum computers will be fabulous for, for example, um, sorting out prime numbers, decrypting numbers. It can take a thousand digit number and break it into two primes maybe in 10 minutes, while a traditional computer may well take, well, it can take even hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years to do that sort of job. And our last com new computing paradigm model was the molecular model, where molecules, and there's trillions of molecules even in a cubic centimetre of, of fluid or of matter, and they can all work in parallel. Each molecule becomes a node in a network and it can solve problems, combinatorial problems, like the travelling salesman model, where, you, where a salesman has to travel between 20 different towns, only going to each one once in the shortest possible time, the shortest possible route. And um, the molecules, each molecule can represent a different uh, town. So, and they can cling together. They, um, the molecules involved in DNA, for example, the bases, combined together in different combinations. So it's 
not too hard to get to use these combinations to represent segments of those routes between towns, for example, or any other any other interpretation of the node in a network. And uh, so gradually it can piece together the better and better and better network until it finally gets a solution out of all the trillions of combinations. And even though it might take 20 seconds for two molecules to sort of come together, because there are trillions doing it simultaneously, then we have an, an amazingly powerful system. Lots and lots of researchers work on in these areas, in each of these areas. For example, with the new supercomputers, there's thousands, tens of thousands of young scientists beavering away to make silicon work faster. There's probably a couple of thousand researchers currently working in the quantum computing field. Now, there's a number working to try to understand the relationship between neurons and behaviour. And they've built a few uh, little models, and they've started with insect models. They call them biobots, actually. It's to understand the linkage between the brain and behaviour. Um, so what they've started with, and this research is probably only a, a couple of decades old at this stage, and probably most of it is occur has been occurring since the 90s. They start with fairly simple insect behaviour and try to model it artificially. So they create, uh, in the first instance, a lot of researchers are interested in rats, because rats tend to be the sort of one of the models that's sort of uh, applied uh, uh, most easily, I guess, uh, in this field. Rats have quite a good mind, quite a good brain. In fact, they have several million neurons. And one of the classic things, one of the classic tricks for a rat to master is to find its way through a maze and find its way to food at the centre. And uh, biologists for a long time thought that basically that was uh, the rat builds cognitive maps in its mind. And when you take it to another identical maze, after a while it should be able to find its way to that, uh, to that food again because it's built a map from the first maze, from its learning process. However, cyberneticists are a little more sceptical, so they decided to model this, and they did this uh, using about an artificial neural network, a network sort of modelled in, uh, on a normal computer, with about 10 neurons. Uh, again, neurons take inputs from other neurons. Uh, once the combination of those inputs reaches a threshold, it fires, and there's an output which passes to another neuron, and it builds... In, in real life, it, this, this builds enormous patterns, contains memory and cognitive thinking and so forth. So they built this from a very minimalist, a very minimalist approach. And uh, in fact, their little robot using artificial neurons looked a bit like a, uh, an electronic biscuit because uh, it uh, was just an electronic chip with wheels on wheels. And uh, again, embedded in there was uh, some simple neural networks, some simple artificial neural networks. So they, they trained uh, the neural networks, gradually learnt the pattern of the little robot rat going, turning left, turning right, forming different patterns, and they tuned the network, in fact using a genetic algorithm, to tune the thresholds and tune the number of nodes. And they got a super robot rat out of that, that with only 10 neurons controlling, and, and it had of course sensors as well, infrared sensors and touch sensors, so it could find its roll its way through the maze. But with that simple equipment, it was able to emulate a normal rat. So that was quite an achievement, and it proved that um, you can model quite sophisticated behaviour with quite a, a small number, a reduced set of neurons. They applied the same trick to crickets. Crickets have a habit of being drawn to the song of their potential mates. Crickets, as you know, chirp. And they chirp, um, they use a standard sort of uh, single carrier frequency. And each species locks into that frequency. And the frequency of the little chirps attracts the mate. So the, 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 the uh, cricket that's being attracted has to work out which direction the mate's in and how far away and whether the sound's right, whether it's chirping, it's the right sort of relative. Um, so again, this was modelled. Crickets pick this up through their little legs, actually. They have sort of their eardrums in their legs with a little, uh, a little channel that goes through, through their body to their neurons. And again, they have hundreds and possibly thousands of neurons too. 
But again, they're able to model this using four neurons, um, two controlling the, the little motors that enable the, the, the bionic cricket to move towards the source of the sound, and another two to analyse the pattern. And they are able to achieve a realistic cricket pattern understanding behaviour. Again, these sorts of projects um, often take years. They sound relatively simple when I'm describing an overview of them, but in fact, they, uh, they're, they're, they take very sophisticated insights, very sophisticated modelling. And it's only recently, again in the last 10 years, that this understanding of neural network uh, pattern matching has, has been able to, has enabled this to take place, enable these little biobots to be created. And the last uh, insect emulation behaviour was done with ants. Cyber ants are another useful model for understanding the relationship between the brain and behaviour. Ants are excellent in their ability to return to their nest after foraging for food. They can go as far away as 100 metres and they can always return without any problem. They do it by apparently being able to measure the angle between their journey and the polarisation of the sun. The sun's light is polarised by molecules in the air and the ants can line up with the uh, solar meridian, the main line through that polarisation uh, process, and they can, when they're ready to come back, they set the same angle and return. Um, now that's been modelled now by another group and they've been able to do it with a relatively small number of neurons. Um, they've been able to do it, in fact, with three neurons. And again, they have a little robotic model, a little model on wheels that's tuned into polarised light. And uh, they've been able to duplicate exactly what the ants do using, again, this simple relationship between artificial neural networks and uh, simple electronically controlled uh, robotics. So there we have uh, advances being made in that area. But perhaps the most interesting advances are being made in the real cyborg area, linking living cells, living neurons, with computers. This is really the most exciting phase at the moment, the most exciting series of experiments that are being performed that will guide our future into a new cyber world. This direct linkage with living neurons and electronics uh, cybernetics in general. This is really the next major phase and this brings us into the almost the cyborg revolution but again it starts with very simple processes and one of the earlier experiments again uh, about eight years ago now was with snails. Two neurons from snails were encased in silicon and they were allowed to grow and eventually after two days they linked up they started to exchange electricity electrical signals between the neurons and they started to well, were linked to an electronic chip and the chip uh, was also excited and the uh, ability then to, to go around in this loop was, was achieved just from neurons in a dish connected to uh, electrodes. Well that was the beginning but really following that there's been some much more exciting work. Uh, one of these areas again is, is back to our friend the rat or in this case, we can call we can call it the vir <coughs> excuse me the virtual rat. Now the um, the virtual rat was a massive tangle of rat brain cells, probably uh, several thousand that are kept um, kept alive, if you like, and connected to 60 electrodes. And uh, those electrodes then were connected to a computer and a virtual environment for that virtual rat. The, the, the neurons were living, but of course, and they were from a rat. Um, the, the object here was to see if the, an emergent behaviour occurred. In other words, after a while, what would these cells do in response to feedback from the virtual uh, environment? So patterns were gradually evolved out of the tangle of, of electronic pulses that were going on, electrical pulses, that occur in neurons, live neurons, and um, these uh, patterns represented were represented by a small dot on a screen uh, run by a computer, and feedback 
was obtained and fed back into the mass of cells. So in fact, certain patterns allowed the dot to go up, to go left, to go right, and when the feedback was, uh, when feedback was achieved, when a total circuit was, was achieved, some new interesting emergent behaviours started up. It took a while, it, and the, the behaviours were sort of um, quite un, um, undetermined, predetermined. There was, no, there was no trying to assist it to work a particular way, it was just left to its own devices. And after a while, this tangle of neurons started to virtually control the dot that was moving around the screen. Now that experiment is still in process, and uh, I guess uh, very soon we may have the next results from that. Um, another group at the same time were working with a lamprey. A lamprey, in fact, is a very prehistoric fish. It was around before dinosaurs. Um, and a brain stem was taken from the lamprey and again connected to a computer with biofeedback. And uh, there was some... Um, uh, really, it was designed, it was designed to link up also to a little robot that was light sensitive. So in fact, when the light shone on the... On the was picked up by the light sensors of the robot, this was transferred to the lamprey's brain stem. It reacted and sent signals back and moved away. First of all, it moved towards the light, but later when the light got very strong, it moved away. So those patterns emerged again spontaneously, as with the, uh, with the rat, with the, with the uh, virtual rat. And again, what the scientists were after was understanding this linkage, the very first experiments between live cells and, uh, and computer feedback, computers and electronics. They were looking for things that happened. They wanted to see whether coherent streams of behaviour would occur, and that's exactly what did happen. The latest experiments involve primates and even humans. And this, of course, raises serious ethical uh, concerns. Those concerns were there also in the previous experiments where live neurons were connected to computers. Were those electronic, biological animals alive or not? So there's a, there is a current debate by philosophers, ethicists and biologists to just thrash these sorts of issues out because they're vital. In the case of primates, uh, probes were planted in the cortex of several monkeys so that patterns could be picked up when the, when the monkey moved its arm. Now the idea of this was to imitate the action of the animal's arm in a robotic form. Now this has potential benefits for humans in the form of being able to operate prostheses, artificial arms, artificial limbs. Uh, there are definitely some, some major potential benefits, but there are still issues of ethics involving using primates for the experiments. But in the experiments, there was feedback again. Uh, when the monkey raised its arm or moved it, the signals were translated, and using also, again, neural networks to do that, they were analysed, translated and converted to a form where they were, could guide a robotic arm. And then there was feedback coming to the animal's brain, to the primate's brain, from the robotic arm. So what it made of that feedback, no one quite knows, but it possibly learnt to control the movements of its own arm in relation to this other arm. But the experiments are still, are still pending. And... Um, Again, there is value there, but again, there are issues as well. Coming to the latest experiments with humans, of course, these are self, um, one might say, self-inflicted uh, experiments. There's a very famous case where a, um, a, uh, a mathematician, I think, and also someone who works in the biological field, informatics, has inserted a chip into, attached a chip, an electronic chip, to the radial nerve in his, uh, in his arm. So that when the arm moves, again when it flexes, a signal is sent from the chip uh, and can be transmitted to a computer or even to another human. In fact, uh, that, that brings a new sense, uh, a new meaning to the phrase feel the pain. Because theoretically, uh, if that, uh, where the chip is implanted, if the person feels pain, 
theoretically that could be translated to someone else and trigger the nerve impulses in their radial nerve going to the brain, they would feel. Uh, in fact, there are two researchers working on this together, so we'll know the results. Even further, of course, it may be possible to transfer eventually memories from one human through an electronic interface to another human. But we can talk about that again on another program. In the meantime, the first cyborg, in a sense, has already emerged. The first bionic person, even in a very elementary way. But we must remember that it is totally elementary at the moment. There are, there are also major projects to implant artificial retinas, and of course uh, cochlea is a major company that produces the cochlear hearing aid, where the electronic uh, interface is linked to the, to, the, uh, to, the oral, to the oral nerve, the cochlea, in the, in the, in the, deep in the ear, and uh, they're very successful transplants. Uh, to give you an idea of the complexity of these things, though, um, there are 130 million cells called rods and cones in the eye that pick up light intensities, colours, etc. You've all heard of them. Um, there are also a roughly 1.2 million neurons in the optic nerve. The latest subretinal implants have a few hundred thousand connections as against 130 million that, are, that do exist in normal, in normal retinas. And the connection is still very problematic, but it's happening. Enormous research is going into it, enormous effort, enormous numbers of researchers. So we can see that uh, Bionic Man is slowly emerging. Viewers, you can see the trend lines here. You can see, first of all, from the early computing that was done in the 50s, the first computers, the first commercial computers in the 50s. You can see how that evolved, and of course there, was er there were earlier developments going back back into time, if you take in the early calculators and the abacus and so forth. But from the 50s things ramped up and in the 70s we got the smaller computers, the mini computers, eventually the desktop computers, and then networks started to appear, linking those together in the 70s and 80s. And of course in the 90s the internet arrived and started to link all these devices together. But the computers started to really shrink. Remember, in the 50s, they probably filled the room, filled up the whole of your house. Computers are getting smaller and smaller, and gradually they'll virtually disappear. And they'll disappear into your clothing, they'll disappear into digital jewellery, they'll disappear into the walls of rooms, but they'll be everywhere connecting. And this really will be the topic of our next, uh, of our next program. The way that everything will link up but everything will be always on, always linked up. Humans and computers will merge, virtually merge, and there'll be a symbiosis between the two. That's the program that we'll have for you next time. I'm David Tower, and you've been watching the Theories of Everything program again on Channel 31 Community Television. I'll look forward to seeing you again next week.